We'll talk about the characteristics of EVs versus uh, internal combustion engine cars and uh, a little about the economics and about batteries and charging. And then what's it really like uh, in terms of driving experience, uh, both locally and, and long distance. Um, and then we'll talk about a bunch of myths, a couple of which uh, you covered in the uh, uh, poll. So a few definitions. So internal combustion engine, ICE, uh, there's EV and battery EV. I use them interchangeably and that's uh, an electric vehicle powered only by batteries. There's plug-in hybrid EVs. And uh, basically that's an ICE vehicle with electric motor and batteries to uh, provide all electric uh, drive for maybe 25 to 50 miles of, for urban travel. And then if you go long distance, it reverts to a regular hybrid, which is a hybrid EV. And that's an ICE car with electric motor and uh, even fewer batteries and probably only has a few miles of range uh, on electric power. But what it allows you to do is greatly, inf well, significantly increase the efficiency and uh, characteristics of, of the uh, gasoline or diesel engine that's that's driving the car because you can you can keep it operating in a in a much better operating zone. You're not using using it or getting power from it when it's at an idle. <clears throat> and then there's a miles miles per gallon E. So that's a National uh, Trans Transportation and uh, Safety Association and an EPA standard from 2013. So basically they decided in order to compare an EV with a gasoline powered car, they would take the energy that's contained in one gallon of gasoline, which is equivalent to 34 kilowatt hours of, of electricity. And then, uh, you know, if you have an ICE car, it's just the number of miles you travel times uh, divided by the gallons of gasoline that it takes to travel those miles. And instead they've turned that all into an energy equation. So it's uh, how much energy you use uh, to travel however many miles uh, and, and compare that to the energy in a gallon of gasoline. So as an example there, um, if you traveled uh, 20 miles in a gasoline powered car, uh, or, and you multiply that by the uh, energy in one gallon of gasoline, which is 34 kilowatt hours, but you only use five kilowatt hours to travel that 20 miles, then it's equivalent on an energy basis of traveling 116 miles per gallon equivalent. So it's kind of how much energy is in the gallon of gasoline and how far will that take the gasoline car and how far will the same amount of energy in the battery take a battery powered car? So they're, they're kind of directly comparable that way. All right, so let's talk about the early history. So um, the reason I smiled when you said uh, maybe some of you uh, rode in the first EV, well, I don't think so. So the first practical electric cars were based on a lead acid battery, which is, was invented in 1859. And, then uh, in 1890, the uh, first successful electric car was uh, built in the United States by an Iowa chemist. Somebody mentioned they had a chemical engineering degree. Uh, and that was uh, Oliver Fritchley. And so that was the beginning of EVs in the United States. Uh, in Europe, it was uh, uh, 1859. So 1895 to 1920 was really the golden age of electric vehicles. And there were at that, during that period of time, there were electric taxis, vans. Those are like delivery vans. We'd call them panel trucks or something now. Uh, and EVs for society women. And I'll explain that in a few minutes. By 1900, 30% of the vehicles in New York City were electric. Uh, we're not counting hosts, of course, and buggies. Uh, we're just saying uh, powered cars 
not not uh, um, biologically powered cars and trucks. And between 1900 and 1910, there were many EV brands. 90% of the taxis in New York City um, were electric. And um, there were many delivery service, services started using EV uh, delivery wagons. So recall at that time, electricity was really only in 35% of the homes by 1920. And uh, so some of the EV makers also uh, made a uh, generation station running on gasoline that people could install uh, that power plant in their stable for charging their EV. And I say stable because they're transitioning from, from horse power to, uh, to an electric car. So they had to kind of do two jumps at once. Of course, uh, there was electricity in you know, New York City homes at the time. So, so they didn't have to use the power plant. And uh, so by 1910, New York City had hundreds of public charging stations throughout the uh, city. And they must have had kind of a common, uh, you know, plug and so forth. So uh, any of the, all, all the EVs that were available at the time could charge. Interestingly, the wives of Edison, Ford, and Rockefeller all had electric cars. So here's a, a picture of uh, Fritchley and uh, his electric car. Kind of very tall looking car, as many were at, that at the time. This was early. Uh, and here's a, in a picture from 1906 from the Detroit News newspaper. And uh, it's an electric wagon delivering beer, Stroh's beer, you might notice. And uh, so that, that was an electric delivery van. And now let me talk about electric cars at the time. It, so it turns out that women did not like gasoline powered cars at all. They, they had, they smelled like oil and gasoline. They, so they kind of stunk. They were very noisy and you had to crank them to start them. And uh, the cranking was not only hard, uh, it was dangerous. And uh, lots of people, uh, you know, broke their thumb or their wrist or their arm if the uh, engine backfired while they were cranking it. So as a result of this, uh, electric vehicle make makers started marketing their uh, cars to women. And uh, so here's an example of an ad from Baker Electric and um, uh, marketing their car to women, society women, because you had to be fairly rich at the time to order to buy an electric car, kind of like now, isn't it? Um, and uh, these cars are pretty interesting. Uh, Jay Leno actually has one of these cars fully restored. And if you look down below the woman in the driver's seat here, you can see the upholstery inside that vehicle looks just like um, uh, a, a woman's um, uh, sitting room in, in, a, in a, a house at the time. It was extremely plush. It's really high quality stuff. So what happened to this great start? Why, why didn't it continue? Well, oil was discovered in Texas and gasoline became cheap. Then Ford and his production line was able to produce a car for $650 while the average price of the electric car was $1,750. Not because it was extrinsically more expensive, it's just that they weren't using a production line to produce the electric car. So um, they were more than two times the price. And unfortunately, marketing of electric cars had kind of cemented the view in everybody's mind that an EV was a woman's car. So the men weren't buying the EVs. Also, electric starters became quite common uh, in the early 1920s. And Ford was one of the last automakers to uh, convert to an electric start 
uh, starter. I think it, uh, his first car was in 1918 that had an electric starter. So once you had electric starters, one of the uh, you know, key benefits of electric vehicles were, uh, were lost. And of course, EVs at the time were only feasible uh, to drive in the city because they had a very short range. So you could, couldn't get too far away from uh, a charging point. You certainly couldn't drive them from one city to another. Or if you uh, lived on a farm, you, you uh, probably couldn't drive them into town and back if you were you know, 10 miles out of, the, out of the town. And finally, the Great Depression finished off EV industry by uh, 1935. So now let's skip to the more recent history because once uh, EVs died there, they ne never really came back, although some people were experimenting with uh, electrifying cars in the 70s and 80s, but it was uh, you know, kind of a hobbyist type of market. So uh, what happened? Well, in, in the 1980s, um, we got new battery technology, lithium ion, that's powering all of our computers now and watches and so forth. And then uh, in early 1990, the California Air Resources Board pushed for lower emissions vehicles. And so they were putting pressure on car manufacturers to uh, produce vehicles with lower emissions. And uh, it's not too much you can do with a, with a gasoline power car to lower their emissions. So in response, Honda, Chrysler, Ford, GM, uh, Nissan, and Toyota all developed EVs. So this is uh, in the 1990s. Most of us don't even know about this, although you might be familiar with the largest program, and that was General Motors. And they had what they called the EV1. And they made about 1,100 cars, a little more than 1,100 cars. And those cars were leased to their customers for two years. Turns out the people really love these cars. But the program ended after two years. And GM forced the cars uh, to be returned to them against the customer's wishes. They wanted to keep them because they really liked them. And uh, most EV1s were actually sent to a crusher and, and destroyed. It turns out quite a few motors were salvaged, but uh, the cars themselves were all crushed. And uh, so there was actually a movie produced uh, called uh, Who Killed the EV? And uh, it covered that this whole EV1 program. And basically, they had a reasonable EV for that period of time and that technology, uh, but they didn't really want to make them. And I'll explain why. Well, dealers then uh, um, shortly after this, uh, California Air Resources Board, um, which is abbreviated CARB, uh, they sued CARB and they were able to get the mandate uh, essentially neutered. And why would dealers do this? Well, dealers make almost all of their profits in, uh, from services to cars, not by selling the cars. They make a few hundred dollars, even with rebates they get from the manufacturer. You know, it's never more than a thousand dollars a car that they make. So they have to make all their money on services. Well, these EVs, even the early ones, EV ones. Uh, they didn't really require service. So if you don't come in, you know, every six months for an oil change and filter change and those kinds of things, uh, they couldn't figure out how to make a profit of their business. So they hated it. So there were uh, quite a few public protests by the EV drivers groups, which were kind of self-formed from uh, people that owned the EVs from these various companies. And uh, they were quite upset by the repossession of their cars. And so that actually caused Toyota to sell them 328 RAV4 EVs through 2002. Interestingly, Toyota continues to support these cars. Well, that's a pretty interesting fact because that means that these 20-year-old EVs 
Some of them are still in operation. So basically automakers did not want to sell EVs and they wanted it to look like there was no demand for EVs um, because they just, the automakers also knew that they were going to have trouble making a profit with the cars because of the expense of the batteries. And they didn't know how to manufacture batteries cheap enough to compete with uh, gasoline powered cars. So then the first modern EV company was formed. And that was in 2003. And two guys, Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpening, got together. And uh, Eberhard uh, had money from uh, a company that he sold. And he was a rich 43-year-old engineer entrepreneur. And uh, he uh, wanted a sports car. But all of them had less than 20 miles per gallon. And so he commissioned a company by the name of AC Propulsion to make him an electric sports car. And he gave them 100K, uh, of, he promised to pay them 100K and he gave them 150K for development of the car. So they joined forces and, and formed this uh, new company called uh, Tesla. And uh, then after three years, they uh, had a little trouble, uh, you know, actually making this car. And um, so they needed more investment. And Elon Musk, uh, who was interested in EVs, uh, more interested in sustainable energy, but EVs is one way to do that. And he invested most of the six and a half million in 2006 to enable a production of a very expensive $60,000 sports car based on an electrified Lotus from the UK. Uh, and they hired the chief engineer from Lotus uh, um, uh, later, uh, later in time. And they produced this roaster from, uh, well, they, they finally produced the roaster in 2006. They showed a prototype and that actually changed the view of an EV. Because prior to that, EVs were kind of souped up golf carts and uh, nobody really thought they were uh, cars that would compete with uh, regular gas powered cars. But this prototype, anyone that drove this and they had a kind of a big prototype event and they let uh, mostly rich people that they invited drive this prototype and uh, they got quite a few orders because it was a thrill to drive. It handled well and it had extreme acceleration compared to a typical gasoline powered car. It won the Time Magazine best inventions for 2006 in the area of transportation. They produced it from 2006 to 12, total of 2,500 vehicles. Then they hired uh, Peter Rawlinson, the chief engineer from Lotus, to uh, set up production of uh, the Model S. And uh, it was actually, was they canceled an existing project that uh, Tesla had, and they were getting help from Detroit auto executives. Uh, and the Detroit executives said that, that they needed a thousand people to do the design job for the Model S. And Rollison, uh, when Elon Musk asked, asked Peter Rollison uh, what he thought of that, he thought it was crazy and he thought he could do it with 10 people. So, uh, so he got the job. And uh, so it took him a while, but uh, they were, they were shooting for 70, 70 to 125K and they wanted to build a car with unheard of performance features and range for an EV. And Consumer Reports who tested this first car when it came out in uh, um, 2012, they said, this car performs better than anything we've ever tested before. Let me repeat that. This is what they actually said in the magazine. Not just the best electric car, but the best car. 
it does just about everything really, really well. And in fact, they had to change the way they rate cars because the Model S exceeded 100 on their 0 to 100 scale. So they produced uh, the Model S from 2012 to the present. And uh, through 2020, they produced about 300,000 of them and sold, sold them all. In fact, they sell every car they produce because they don't actually manufacture the car until they have an order. Um, okay, so then, uh, then they uh, designed a, a Model X luxury SUV. It was really expensive, 80K to 125K. And they showed the concept in 2012. And when they finally uh, produced the car starting in 2015, it was the only SUV to receive a five-star safety rating in all categories. And they um, built a total of 140,000 of these, so about half the number uh, as a Model S. Then they got to the car they really wanted to build all along, uh, which is the Model 3 small sedan. It's actually a medium-sized sedan. It's the same size of a, as a Honda Accord or a Toyota Camry. It was introduced in 2016 uh, with a $35,000 price tag, which actually became 40K to uh, 50K base target price. And that was produced from 2017 to the present. And then uh, they followed that two years later with a Model Y, which was a SUV or maybe a crossover. It fits better as a crossover vehicle. It was produced from 2020 to the present. And the total production is uh, more than a million and a half uh, for through the third quarter of 21. So in order to understand Tesla, uh, you have to really understand their mission. And their mission is not to build cars. Their mission is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. So that will help you understand what Tesla tries to do. So they're in the energy business. They're in, uh, they've set up charging stations uh, all over the developed world. And so that's all part of transitioning the uh, world to sustainable energy. And it's kind of related to electric cars, but it has nothing to do with ma making electric cars. So the other thing to note is breaking into the US auto in industry is so difficult, mainly because of the dealership laws in all the states, that the last company to do it successfully was in 1925. So that's you know, 90 years uh, uh, since Chrysler did it until uh, Tesla did it. Okay, so let's just quickly look at their cars. So there's the Tesla Model S. So it's a full-size sedan. It can be equipped to actually uh, haul seven passengers because uh, you can have rear-facing seats in the back. So it's, it's a big sedan. Here's the Model X. I, I picked a picture with the gullwing doors open uh, to kind of illustrate how revolutionary it was. Those doors can open when you're like eight inches between you and the car next to you in a parking lot. Uh, so you can just barely squeeze through. And uh, you can step up in the car, you're protected from the rain with the doors and you can belt your child in the car seat or whatever you need to do. Uh, so it's, it's very innovative and very nice. Of course, they had lots of problems with these gullwing doors. So uh, it made their reliability poor because of the gullwing doors. So here's a Model 3 and yours truly picking up my Model 3 in October of 2018. And I just wanted to show you the inside because they really rethought automobiles uh, from ground zero. So they uh, knew that it was very expensive to make automobiles because you had these huge 
bundles of wires going all over the car to all of the sometimes 50 or more switches, maybe a hundred even in modern cars, uh, you know, all down the console, across the dashboard, up above in the headliner, there's switches everywhere. So they, they said, well, you can do that a lot more simply uh, with modern technology. Let's just put a computer screen in it and uh, control most of it from the computer screen. So there's only like a dozen switches uh, in this whole car, just the normal, you know, uh, a door uh, switch to open the door, a switch to to run the windows in in the other three doors in the car, and the driver's door, of course, has four window switches. And uh, then there's some switches on the steering wheel and uh, two stocks on the steering wheel. Uh, so that's it. There's not even a button on the uh, glove box. So then the Model Y is uh, built on the chassis of the Model 3. So it kind of similar to Model 3, but it's taller and a little bit longer and maybe slightly wider in the body. So it has quite a bit more hauling capacity and you sit, sit up much higher. Okay, so I don't have to talk to you guys much about the technology adoption curves. You're probably pretty familiar with them, but uh, it's kind of the yellow line, you know, is is how fast uh, you know people you get to 100% market share over time, and so it starts out slowly. This is an S curve. It starts out slowly, and then it can get very steep, and then flattens out near the end. So if you look at real technology curves, uh, some that you're all participated in is uh, you know the the tablet, which almost looks like a vertical line here. It was so it's relatively small cost, lots of uh, uh, functionality and utility. So the penetration rate was extremely rapid. And uh, if you go back to a microwave, you know, it took a little while to get started, but once it hit the steep part of the curve, you know, in, in like 20 years, it went from almost went from 10% to uh, essentially uh, the whole market. But more to the topic for today is automobiles. In 1910, they had a 10% market share. And by 1925, they had a 50% market share. And you can see the, the curve is, is fairly steep. So 15 years, they went from 10 to 50%. Now realize at the time, this took huge amounts of infrastructure too. The roads really weren't adequate for automobiles. There was no gasoline stations, very few in, in 1910. So the entire infrastructure of gasoline manufacture, transport, uh, storage and, and uh, at the gas station and so forth had to be built out. So they had lots of, uh, lots of problems in order to be able to do this. Okay, so let's look at EV adoption. So here's a, a graph of global plug-in vehicle sales. Now plug-in vehicles are both battery electric vehicles, which are shown in green, and then plug-in hybrids that are in blue. And so just note, the auto industry really wants to include plug-in hybrids because they want to appear green to uh, their customers. And so they want to include plug-in hybrids. In fact, some of them even include hybrids as electric vehicles in their reports. Um, so they want to kind of confuse the whole situation and say, hey, you know, we, we make a lot of electric cars too. So. Uh, as a result of that, it's the BEV only data is really hard to find. So anyway, uh, you can see uh, as all the technology adoption curves, it starts out fairly slow. And if you just follow the green tops here uh, in 2020, it starts getting a little steeper. Note this last bar is only the first half of 2021. Uh, the full year 2021 is not in yet. But this green bar is going to be up close to 6 million. This is worldwide, 6 million. So you can see that it just transitioned between 20 and 21. It just made a definite transition to this steep part of the curve. Okay, so basically the adoption rate is already exponential or it's 
becoming exponential everywhere EVs are available. And it's limited by manufacturing capacity, not by the people that want EVs. So if I look at Europe, third quarter of 21, again, fourth quarter numbers aren't out yet, battery electric vehicles were 9.8% of all car, cars sold in the European Union. So it's, uh, and by the end of the year, it was uh, over 10%. And in uh, just the, the month of September, because you're on a steep part of the curve, so it's increasing by large amounts every month. So if you just look at the month of September, Tesla was the best-selling car of any type in Europe. So it beat out, you know, all the BMWs and the Volkswagens and uh, the, all the Japanese cars that are sold in Europe, beat them all out. And also in England, 15% of all the cars sold in September were EVs. So Norway is kind of a special case. Norway has encouraged EVs since like the mid 1990s. And there's a whole story behind it I won't go into, but it was kind of interesting story. It was um, kind of driven by one uh, rock performer who wanted an EV. And uh, so he started uh, uh, driving his EV on the tollways without paying tolls. And they would come and uh, repossess his EV or uh, haul away his EV. And then he would go pay all the tolls to get it out so he could drive it again. And he kept doing this and making lots of news while he's doing it. And eventually, Norway decided, okay, we, we do want to encourage EVs. So uh, let's not charge sales tax on EVs because uh, they're kind of expensive. and um, Let's let them drive on our tollways for free. Let's let them park in the cities for free. And let's let them use the uh, high speed lanes or the taxi only lanes or the multi car, you know, multi uh, passenger lanes uh, uh, if you have an EV. So lots of incentives. So what has happened? Well, if you look at September 2021, 77% of all cars sold in Norway were battery electric vehicles. And if you include the plug-in hybrids, which I don't include, yet 91.5%. So uh, ICE cars have now dropped below 10%. And uh, by the end of the year, it was even less than that uh, of all cars sold in Norway. They predicted that Norway would sell us the last uh, um, ICE car in 2025, but it appears now that by the end of this year, or you know, by 2023, they may not sell any more uh, ICE cars. Meanwhile, China, uh, battery electric vehicles uh, were about 4.6% 4, 4 of the market, according to statistica.com. And um, they, uh, they are actually into EVs in a big way. There are literally 50 companies, new startups that are building EVs. And their major car manufacturers uh, all have EVs that they're now selling. So they're really leading the world in the production of EVs. Well, part of the reason they're doing that is Tesla opened a factory in Shanghai, wholly owned by Tesla, and uh, it's now producing a half million cars a year. So uh, it's the biggest manufacturer of EV in, in China. So now if we look at the uh, US, it's difficult to find numbers here. Uh, so uh, since Tesla sells about 80% of all the EVs that are sold in the United States, I'm just looking at Tesla here. And uh, so you can see this only goes through 2020. So it's just starting to hit the steep part of the curve. And uh, the United States is behind because 
uh, for all of 2021, only about 2% market share of all EVs. And, uh, but again, that's rising fast. Back in, in uh, September, they were 2.6% of vehicles sold in the US. And uh, by the end of the year, I think that was over 3%. So we're kind of behind the rest of the world. You might ask, why is that? Well, one reason is we're a very huge country. Um, we have extremely, uh, the, the laws are biased toward the dealer model of cars and EVs. That's not the best thing to do with EVs, as I mentioned before. Um, meanwhile, in, uh, in 2020, there were 1.1 million EVs sold in China. So you can see uh, in 2020, uh, we, the sales in the United States were under a quarter of a million EVs, and in China, it was over uh, a million. So four times as many BEVs in China. Okay, so now let's, then let's go back to our adoption curve. So the solid lines here are the actual sales of ICE cars at the top in red, and in green at the bottom are battery EVs. And the, the huge uh, decrease in sales of, EV, uh, of ICE cars and the increase in, in EVs in, uh, uh, in the UK was when the lockdown occurred, uh, it became hard to uh, buy EVs because you had to go into the dealer and, and you know some were closed down and so forth. Uh, and meanwhile, ships were arriving with uh, Model 3s from China uh, for the European market uh, in the UK. So that meant there were cars available, electric cars that were available. So you got, it got a spike here. But if you, you know, kind of smooth this curve out and figure out what line were we on in the, in the middle of 2021, if you would have uh, uh, did a curve fit of the S curve with this line, it said that these two lines were going to cross at the, so both would have 50% market share in, uh, at the beginning of 2024. Six months later, at the end of 2021, if you lose, use the new, uh, you know, new curve here and project that out, it's moved closer by a year. So now the 50% point will be January of next year. And of course, these are projections. They may not be exactly that, but it shows you in a six month period, it actually moved in a full year. So why is that? Well, it's because electric cars are better in almost every way from an ICE car. So let's just go through a few. Acceleration. An EV has awesome acceleration. Even EVs that aren't designed to be particularly fast have good acceleration. Uh, and now the fastest production car in the world is an EV. It has a zero to 60 time of two seconds. Whereas a typical gasoline power car, eight seconds, 10 seconds, those are the good ones. You know, six seconds, maybe if you have the hottest sports car, you can get it to four seconds, but you're not gonna ever get it to two seconds. So it's, uh, for an ICE car, it's mediocre at best. So I have a Honda Accord hybrid, which doesn't have a, terrible acceleration. I was satisfied with it. In fact, it was my favorite car that I'd ever owned up until then. Uh, but when I uh, traded in my uh, Lexus on a uh, the Model 3, I then learned what true acceleration really was. So I would take people for uh, a ride in, in an EV since it was new in 2018 and most people hadn't even seen an EV, let alone ridden in one. So I would take my friends for a ride. And I learned after the first friend got in the car and uh, I nailed it uh, after I got out onto the highway. 
and uh, he rammed his uh, back of his head into the the uh, the headrest. And I decided, well, I, I'm going to have to warn people before I do this. So my car, which is not a high performance Model Three, there's uh, one with higher performance than mine, uh, but it it does a zero to sixty in in like four and a half seconds. It's enough to push the cheek your cheeks back. You can feel that your cheeks move back when you hit the accelerator. It's that fast. Energy efficiency. Well, an EV is about 80%. So the energy in the battery to forward uh, motion, you get about 80%. In an ICE car, the best you can do is 20%. So 80% is lost in heat. Of course, you can use some of that heat now in the middle of the winter, but most of the time it's just lost heat. You have to you know, put it in the atmosphere. Cornering. So an EV has little to no body roll. Basically, all EVs are more like sports cars than EVs, are, are than, uh, than whatever car they are. So my Model 3 drives like a sports car. Uh, when I take a corner at high speed, I can take a corner at 40 miles an hour that you wouldn't want to take more than 20 miles an hour in a regular car. When uh, my friends ride in with me, they're just, they're just awed by how it corners. And of course, with an ICE car, you get noticeable body roll because of the weight of the engine and the gasoline is all above the tire, all above the wheels. And so there's a lot of rotation of the car. Emergency handling. So they have this test, they call it a moose test. So it's supposed to simulate a moose walking in front of you or jumping out of the ditch in front of you or a deer. And uh, so you have to swerve into the lane to the left and then swerve back into your own lane. And an, an EV can do that test, moves test at greater than 50 miles per hour. So my Model 3 can do it at like 52 miles an hour without knocking over any cones. In an ICE car, uh, most ICE cars are good to maybe 35. And the really good ones, the sports car like ICE cars can do it at 45. So you can see there's just an inherent advantage in, in the way they're built. Noise. Well, you, uh, the, the noise level is really excellent uh, in, in an EV. And the, the only noise you have is the wind noise. Uh, and that's not even that much because they're also built to be fairly, uh, slip through the air fairly efficiently because that's, the, the biggest uh, loss of energy is uh, wind resistance. Uh, and of course you can hear the tires, especially depending on the, uh, the road surface. And of course in the ice car, you have the same, plus at low speeds below 45 or 50 miles an hour, the engine is making a huge rack. You don't realize how huge a rack it is until you own an EV and then you get in an ice car. Winter and summer comfort. So I would rate an EV excellent. So basically, you heat it and cool it in your garage. And I'll talk more about that later. But uh, so, you know, it was one degree this morning when I got up in Illinois. And uh, had I been going somewhere, I didn't go anywhere today, but had I been going somewhere, I would have had set my car on the time I wanted to leave. And it would have been heated and ready to go when I walked to the garage. So I only have, you know, the 20 feet from my garage door to the car door that I would have to endure the cold. And then I'd get in and it'd be like being in the house. So an ice car, of course, you can start them and pre-warm them, but you have to back them out of your garage first. So you already have to go, uh, go out and then you have to go back in and finish a cup of coffee or whatever you're gonna do, waiting for it to warm up. And it's gonna take uh, you know 10 or 15 minutes before it's really warm. So maintenance effort and cost. So you have to think about maintenance in two ways. Uh, and, you know, one is clearly cost, how much it costs you to, to operate the car. But there's also a time element. So in the case of an EV, maintenance effort is really excellent. So basically, in the three plus years I've owned the car, I've replaced the cabin filter, air filter. And 
I've replaced the wipers. I did, I did replace a set of tires too. Um, but that, that's another story. Um, so ba basically I had one, you know, service that I had to do on the car in, in, uh, two years. It's actually two and a half years when I did it. And it took me literally 15 minutes total because the service was a mobile service. The guy came to my driveway and did it, and replace the filter wipers and check the uh, the uh, brake fluid. And I scheduled that online. Uh, it took me about five minutes to schedule a service visit. And I wouldn't even had to be here to have him fix the car. Uh, of course, I really spent more than 15 minutes because I wanted to go out and talk to the guy while he was working on my car. I discovered he was a Mercedes mechanic that saw the writing on the wall and decided he better uh, go start servicing EVs. So he's a mobile service uh, guy for, for Tesla now. So an ICE car basically in comparison is poor. So it requires roughly, you know, depending on how much you drive and so forth, roughly a six month oil and filter change, uh, requires air cleaners, requires an emission test, my Honda Accord hybrid is old enough now. It's a, a 2014, so it's eight years old. So now I have to get an emissions test every year. So in a, in a two year period, it has to go in three to five times. So every one of those times is a minimum of an hour. And depending on what it is, they might have to keep the car and so now I have to go to the dealer twice or the repair shop twice. So you had all, all that time. You're talking many hours. I mean, at best, four or five hours of your time spent in maintenance compared to 15 minutes. Convenience. Well, basically, I refuel in the garage. And the car is, is not bad. The, the reason an ice car is not bad is because there's gas stations all over the place. So you, all you have to do is find the gas station. Of course, you do have to stand there in uh, five degree weather and uh, fill your car with gas. So range. So here's the single place where EVs are not yet comparable to ICE cars. So, but most EVs now have on the order of two to 300 miles. So they're getting reasonable. And a few now have four or 500 miles. And there's also kind of a limited availability of fast charging. And we'll talk more about this later, except for the case of Tesla. Tesla has a very large network of chargers in, in Europe and England and China and, uh, and the United States. And it's growing in even places like Australia. So, uh, so it's pretty good for Tesla, but it's a little limited for other cars. And of course, an ICE car, a lot of them get more than 400 miles, uh, you know, some sports cars and, and uh, others might only have a 300 mile range. But since you can get gas almost anywhere, you don't really care of, uh, that the range is, is small. Refuel time. Well, now this is interesting. So, one of the people, one of the things people say against electric cars is, wow, it takes forever to charge. Well, that's kind of true. Uh, so it, it takes uh, me 12 minutes to eight hours to charge my car, depending on where I'm charging it and how I'm charging it and whether it's uh, fast charging or slow. But you don't have to be there while it's charging. So most of the time my car is charging, I'm sleeping. So it costs zero time. So it may take eight hours to fully charge my car overnight, but it only took me 30 seconds, 15 seconds to plug it in, 15 seconds to unplug it. So in terms of my time, it's not costing me anything. It's costing me less than filling up the tank of gas because it takes you about eight minutes to fill up the tank of gas. Plus you have to drive to the gas station even if you do it on your way somewhere, you still have to pull into the gas station. So you're, you're losing 
using at least 10 or 15 minutes to fill the car with gas. Okay, so why is this? Well, let's look a little bit about the mechanics of these cars. So this is a, a kind of a internal diagram of, of a Model 3. So all the blue is high strength steel. Notice the number of steel girders in the door. And then there's this huge panel down here of steel. That's the case for the batteries. Notice where that is in relation to the wheel hub. So the wheel hub is here, batteries are down here. So the batteries weigh a thousand pounds. They offset the weight of uh, all the upper part of the car, just the batteries. Notice the motor is mounted about even with the center of the wheels. So basically that's why it doesn't roll and that's a roll when you take a sharp corner and that's why it's so stable. And by the way, this is the safest car ever tested by the National uh, Highway uh, Traffic Safety uh, Association. And um, it's uh, five star rated in every category. And if, if you look at the probability of injury of both the passengers and the driver, it has the lowest numbers of any car they've ever tested. So that's, that's for two reasons. One is because it's an EV, there's no in, huge engine that's sitting out in front of the car that can get jammed back into the passenger compartment but it's also the design of the car. For example, the front wheels on this car, the front link of the wheel is just slightly weaker than the back link. So if you hit this from the front, the wheels fold out so that they don't come into the cabin. So they really thought about safety when they designed this car. Okay, so if you buy an EV, it's, uh, it's gonna change you. Here's some, here's some ways it's changing. Hopefully some of these are a little funny. You will look at gas stations. That's a place where ice owners go to suffer. So uh, I went to a gas station in November. First time I'd been there for over a year to uh, fuel up my uh, wife's Honda. And uh, I, I discovered that they now have chip readers in gas stations. I, I hadn't seen that before, but it was a pain because you had to take your credit card out to fill your car. It was awful. And, uh, you know, I'm standing there and I was at a station that uh, also has diesel pumps. And so there was like diesel spilled diesel fuel there. So it it kind of stunk and, and my feet kind of stuck to the pavement. And so it was just awful. Um, you'll start to hate the smell of ice cars. I, uh, so I've never smoked. So uh, sometimes when I uh, have mowed my lawn, I can smell somebody smoking a half a block away just because you're, you're sensitive to it if you aren't in smoke all the time. Well, the same thing happens with a car. So now when I pull up behind cars and waiting for a stoplight, I sometimes turn the ventilation system off because of the smell, especially in the wintertime. You'll never again will you leave the house with a low fuel tank because there's no reason to. You can... Anytime the tank is even a little bit low, you know, if it's more than less than 50% full, you can just plug it in. And so it's uh, full the next morning. Uh, you will one day get into an ice car and not like it. And I already mentioned that. Uh, I mean, this Honda was my favorite car, but now when I get into it, I don't like the feel of the seat. I don't like all of the buttons and switches, you know, I just don't like anything about it. It's, by the way, you know, you, you look at that center screen and you think, well, gee, you have to look over to the right instead of looking straight in front of you. Well, it turns out, I didn't realize that was how much a disadvantage that was to me, but I'm tall, six foot three. And so I always had to have the steering wheel higher than I would like it for comfort so that I could see the speedometer. That's not a problem in my car. So you get used to preconditioning the carbon ca cabin, car cabin. I mentioned that. You get used to single pedal driving and you will love it. So single pedal driving. Since EVs uh, recharge the battery uh, 
when you let off the accelerator, they have a pretty dramatic uh, deceleration when you, if you let off, off on the accelerator all the way. So when you come to a stoplight, uh, you will quickly learn, takes a week or two, to how to let off the accelerator at the right rate so you bring the car to a full stop before the light, all, and with a recent update in my car, well, it was about a year ago, they changed it so that it uh, would decelerate charging the battery down to nearly zero. And then it automatically applies the brakes and locks the car in position. So if you're faced uphill or downhill at the stoplight, you're not gonna roll. So as a result, uh, I often go a month or even more and never touch the brake. It's just so convenient. Pull into the garage, let off on the accelerator, car stops, you get used to it. You can stop right on the spot every time. You will not miss the car dealer, I promise you. You'll get used to the car helping you drive on long and relaxing trips. So a lot of cars do this now with lane keeping, uh, not just EVs, but uh, you know, all uh, kind of luxury cars at least uh, have lane keeping uh, and uh, traffic adaptive cruise control. So uh, it, you know, it slows down if you come upon a truck and so forth. Well, in addition, uh, my EV uh, will actually drive itself on the interstate. It'll do all the driving. So you really um, have a whole different process on a long trip. And you're sitting there and you're kind of doing this strategy of driving because you don't have to deal with all the details of keeping the speed right, watching the speedometer. You don't have to do any of that. You can look around. You can see what, how the traffic is developing. You can see where you want to you know, change lanes or not and so forth. Or you can let the car do it, but you can choose to do it yourself. But as a result, you can take a you know 600 mile car trip in a day, and uh, or even more 700. And when you get there and close your eyes at night, you don't see the dotted the white dashed line going through your vision when you close your eyes because you're not staring at the lines. You don't have to pay attention to them. And you most likely will not be in buying another ICE car. Within a few weeks of owning this car, I said, I'm never going to drive another ICE car or own another ICE car. Okay. And finally, you'll become annoying to your friends and family and maybe even to the and uh, Computer Club. You'll have to tell me about that. Range. So range is uh, kind of a big issue that people have, but you need to think about range in a, from a different perspective than you do with a ICE car. So a few facts. U.S. drivers average about 30 miles driven per day. Only 10% go more than 60 miles in a day, and only 1% average more than 100 miles per day. So that means if you have an EV, you never have to worry about the range for all the typical days that you're driving from home. Because if you have an EV with 250, 300 miles of range, you can cover the whole gamut here. So, but at least 90% of the people would never have to worry about range when they're driving it close to home. Because you can begin every day with a full let me say 80 or 90% charge on your battery. So 200 miles of range is sufficient for almost all normal use. Well, that's not quite the whole story because uh, my view is uh, my car has to be able to take long trips too because I take long trips often. Uh, I've driven 15,000 miles in long trips since I've owned a car for th three years ago. And uh, so, Long distance travel, it's nice to have like 350 miles of range. You can do it with 250 miles, uh, maybe with a couple extra stops, uh, but I think you, you ought to have 300 miles of range or more 
to make it easy. And it allowed you to go almost everywhere. So there's quite a few EV challenges. In the short term, EVs are both battery and manufacturing, car manufacturing limited. So basically, everybody's able to sell all the EVs they make. Now, that doesn't mean they want to sell EVs. Uh, I've read that uh, Ford dealers are tacking on $20,000 above list to buy a Ford Mustang Mach-E electric vehicle. So they don't really want to sell you the car. That makes uh, Mach-E way more expensive than a Tesla, for example. But that's going to be the case for some time. There's also a slow response by legacy auto manufacturers, which leads to a lack of supply of EVs. So they didn't really get that this transition was going to occur and how rapidly it might occur. Um, so they started late. They didn't really figure it out until 2019. And then they decided, oh, this may be real. These are going to compete with us. So we have to come up with an EV strategy. So it put them years behind. So we could have had more EVs had they been on the ball. So in the medium term, the battery supply will still be limited for some time. It takes, well, unless you're Tesla, it takes two or three years to build a battery plant and get it online and get it up to you know, a high production rate. So we, we know that we're three, four years from having enough batteries. Uh, there's also many people that are threatened, industries and people that are threatened by EVs. Obviously, the oil industry, which want to continue to sell, sell their gasoline. Not that they make a lot of money, at least the gas stations don't make a lot of money, but the oil industry as a whole makes a lot of money. Auto suppliers, you know, there's a huge number of auto suppliers uh, kind of organized around the engine of an ice car. You know, the filter makers, uh, uh, all the components in a, in a gasoline engine. So there's uh, lots of third party suppliers that are supplying the automakers uh, and building their engines and so forth. And then, of course, there's auto parts. Same kind of thing. The high, the high maintenance items on uh, ice cars enable auto parts stores to kind of stay, stay open. And so if you're threatened by a change, then you're going to resist it, which is where a lot of the myths are formed about EVs. So in the medium term, there's also a fast charging infrastructure uh, build out that needs to be done. Uh, so we'll talk more about that later. And then there's a residential charge infrastructure. So I mentioned that it's great to have an EV because you can charge it in your garage. Well, what if you don't have a garage? You live in an apartment. Maybe you have a garage, but maybe it doesn't have power. Uh, or you live in a condo or you're in an urban environment. You may live in a house, uh, but there's only on-street parking and there's no place to plug in. So that really needs to be solved before we can move to all EVs. And in the long term, longer term, I think the only restriction is going to be the residential charging infrastructure. And this is where we need uh, local governments to kind of step up and create um, uh, rules about any new construction has to provide uh, charging in all the parking spaces, uh, uh, you know, for that new new unit. Uh, you know. Uh, England is pretty creative and they've already started to convert all of their streetlights to be electric charging points for, for cars. So that's a great way to do it in the city. Since the, there's a lot of extra power in all the streetlights in cities now because all of them have gone to um, LEDs. So there's lots of power left over that you can use to charge your car. So, but that needs to be built out. Okay, let's talk about economics. So the purchase price currently exceeds the competing ICE cars by on the order of five to $15,000, depending on 
the car and the maker and, and uh, how big the car is. Uh, fuel costs for an EV are about 25 to 35% of the fuel costs of ICE cars. So it's uh, my car is about three cents per mile. The car I replaced was 12 cents a mile for fuel. So you get some back there. The maintenance costs are significantly less for EVs over five years. We've already talked about that. Uh, there's some you know things that you still have in an electric car, but you're not using. I mentioned brake pads. Uh, I didn't mention brake pads, but uh, I'm never going to have to change the brake pads in my car because the brakes are never used except for holding the car still, and that doesn't wear out the brake pads. So my guess is uh, I can't own the car long enough to wear out a set of brake pads. Uh, and of course, there's no engine maintenance and so forth. There's no you know, timing change that need to be replaced and you know, all that kind of stuff. Water pumps that go out. Uh, resale values are currently much higher for EVs. So I did the math there uh, you know, to, to derive the three and 12 cents. So you can look at that later uh, if you wanna uh, look get a copy of the presentation. And, uh, but most of the analyses now show that uh, Tesla Model 3 is economically equivalent to similarly equipped Camry or Accord after five years. So even with the uh, Delta at the beginning, uh, after five years, you, you come out the same. So Herbert Dice, the uh, CEO of Volkswagen, actually showed the owner five-year costs of VW's EVs versus their corresponding ICE vehicles in Germany. Now, Germany is a little special case because they don't charge sales tax on EVs. Um, so, you know, they get some advantage there. But the uh, we, we don't have to look at all of this. So basically, let's just look at the, the EV here is the, the green columns. And uh, the uh, ICE car is, is the first column and the second column in each case. In this case, is a Volkswagen brand. And you can just look at the second number here, which is the cost, the, the lower right numbers, the cost per month of owning and operating the car. So the ID, uh, uh, ID4 is um, 183 euros per month. The equivalent ICE car is 233 euros per month. And, you know, per, uh, and this is at 20K per year, which is kind of like, that's like 12K in the United States, 12K miles. So in the case of the next one is 183 versus 283. So it's a hundred euros cheaper to have the EV. And uh, in the case of Audi, it's uh, Audi, it's uh, 183 versus 267. So that's for Germany. It's not quite that good in the United States, but still it's, uh, it's a wash in five years, even in the United States, even without uh, the subsidies for buying EVs. So the big cost uh, in EVs are cost of batteries. So it was almost $1,200 in, in uh, 2010 per kilowatt hour of batteries. EVs have anywhere from 50 to 100 kilowatt hours of battery. So at 100, you know, that's uh, pretty expensive. <laughs> um, and you can see in 2021, uh, our 2020, it was, uh, you know, 100, it's like $139. Uh, and they projected out, but don't believe these projections because everybody is trying to solve this problem. And when you have that many people trying to solve a problem, it gets solved faster than you think it is. Uh, and in fact, Tesla is reported to be under 100 already. So they're right here where I'm pointing. So they're already at the 2023 number. So, uh, so the prices are coming down of batteries. There are many uh, misunderstandings about charging. So let's talk about charging, Start, starting with the AC charging. So there's two basic methods, AC and DC. You guys are technical, so you know what I'm talking about. So AC from any AC uh, source, EVs have an onboard AC charger. 
And of course they have an AC to DC converter to uh, uh, step that voltage up to 400 volts to 800 volts, depending on the car. And uh, so this charges the uh, battery at fairly slow rates because you can't get a lot of power, especially 120 volts. There's, there's a, you can plug it into any outlet anywhere, 120 volts, a 15 or 20 amp outlet. Uh, so my car, you know, comes with a plug that allows me to plug into any outlet. And uh, you can also plug it into uh, 240 volt outlets anywhere from 30 to 60 amps. So 60 amps is uh, uh, used by a Tesla charger. So it's, it's really 30 to, to 50 or so. Um, and a 30 amp is like an electric dryer. That's an electric dryer standard. So 120 volt chargers are called level one chargers or L1. They charge at a pretty slow rate, two to three miles added per hour of charging. Level two chargers charge at uh, 18 to 35 miles per uh, hour of charging. So you can see that overnight with a level two charger, 240 volt charger, you can fully charge uh, your car. Because um, even if you have a 300 mile car, well, the car battery's never empty, you never charge it all the way. So you charge about 80% of the battery. So it's 240 miles. So, you know, that takes uh, even at the low rate takes only 12 hours. And at the high rate takes much less. Uh, by the way, if you do the math here, you'll these kilowatts will be less than the actual power. And it's uh, because you're not really drawing 60 amps, you're only drawing 80% of that, which is the standard for electrical circuit. You don't take the maximum amount the circuit is rated for you take 80%. So there's also L2 destination chargers at stores, restaurants, and hotels more and more hotels all the time. And all of those are 240 volts. So you can always recharge your car overnight. There's two plug types, uh, the Tesla plug, and there's a J1772. There's also a kind of third type, but it's going out. And there's simple adapters between the two. So I have the, the adapter came with my car, so I can charge at uh, uh, both of these plug types. By the way, charging is fully automated. The car knows how long it's going to take based on, uh, you know, how much you want to charge it and how full it is already, and uh, and you have to, you know, set how full you want to allow it to get. But it does all the math and tells you uh, before you, you know, go away how long, you know, when it's going to be fully charged. So in real life, what do these look like? Okay, so this is a wall in my garage. I cut a chunk out of my uh, pegboard uh, uh, on my wall uh, to mount this at, at the height I wanted to mount it. And uh, so this is Tesla charger. It has a 60 amp circuit driving it. So I can do it at the full 11 and a half kilowatts. Uh, outdoors, here's a parking lot. Here's a um, charge point charger. Uh, with its cord, and then here's a Tesla charger, and you'll notice it looks just like my Tesla charger because these chargers are rated for outdoor and indoor service. So you can, if you don't have a garage, you can you can put them outside your house. So then there's DC charging. So it's high speed charging from a DC source, and it directly charges the battery after the car communicates with the charger and negotiates the voltage needs and the maximum current it's allowed to draw from the charger. So Tesla calls these superchargers and the charge rates uh, typically between 75 kilowatts and 350 kilowatts, um, depending on, uh, again, on the car. Uh, let me just say some manufacturers like the uh, Nissan Leaf, they use, uh, pouch batteries and they do not cool the battery pack. So they're limited to 75 kilowatts, no matter, no matter what you plug them into. My car can take 250 kilowatts. Uh, and Tesla has the most expensive, uh, extensive worldwide network, so by far. So the other largest companies in the United States are Electrify America, ChargePoint, EVGo, EV Connect. Many of these provide 
many more L2 chargers than the DC chargers. But you have to be careful, they don't distinguish between the two on the map. So if you look at their map, it looks like, wow, they have lots of chargers. Well, they may not have lots of high speed chargers. Uh, interesting story is Electrify America is actually built by Volkswagen. They were forced to, uh, or their negotiated settlement for Dieselgate in uh, the United States was they had to uh, build uh, electric chargers and spend a billion dollars building out Electrify America. So that's why we have Electrify America. It turns out they're gonna have the last laugh because if they decide to sell Electrify America, they're gonna make more than the money they spent in, in building it. So these, these uh, chargers um, are mostly used for long distance travel or for con commercial vehicles. So if you have an electric taxi, you're, gonna, you're likely gonna charge at a supercharger sometime during the day or a commercial vehicle you may uh, have to charge it. But if for a, a person that owns an EV, they are probably only gonna use DC chargers for uh, long distance travel. And as I mentioned, it depends on the battery level and, and the battery cooling. Uh, cars that are cooling their batteries uh, can charge at much higher rates than those that don't. Cars added, uh, miles added per hour can be as high as a thousand. When I first plug in my car as a supercharger, it'll, it'll peg it at a thousand miles per hour that will be added for charging. Of course, it only does that for 10 minutes, but even 10 minutes, is over 150 miles. So uh, you get lots of charge quickly. Again, all of this is automated. The car will tell you how long the charge is gonna take. And uh, so you don't have to do any calculations. There are two main plug standards now in the United States. A Tesla, they had to invent their own standard because there wasn't one you know, prior to their cars. Uh, and uh, then CCS, which is, uh, uh, really a worldwide standard for uh, uh, charging plugs. And there are adapters between them, but they're kind of complicated and kind of expensive. So, uh, you know, I probably won't get a, you know, CCS adapter for my uh, Tesla. So what do these look like? Well, on the left is a row of Tesla chargers. I think there are six or eight of them in, in the row here. So you just back in and, you know, plug it in the port. Uh, Tesla is totally automatic. You don't have to get out your billfold. You don't have to think about the money. You just plug the car in and then you go have coffee. Um, I'll talk more about that later. So here's a uh, 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 Electrify America charging station, I think. And uh, there's two plugs there because uh, uh, neither one of them are Tesla plugs, but um, they... Uh, because there was a, the Leaf, the Nissan Leaf had their own standard for plugs. So uh, mostly Electrify America have for those two plugs. So eventually though, they're only gonna have CCS and Tesla. So they can get them fairly large. Here's a, a charging, a supercharger uh, location in California and solar panels on the top. So, you know, partially you're driving on sunlight and you can see there's lots of charging charging slots. So what's it like to take a trip in a Tesla? Well, you start the trip with a full battery. That's easy to do. You plug it in at home, it's full. And then uh, you enter your destination. In my case, I just say my destination. It's never, ever not understood the destination I wanted to go to. And it identifies the destination. If there's confusion, if you just say, take me to the Holiday Inn in uh, you know, Springfield, Illinois, it'll show me all the Holiday Inns, I'll pick the one I want. Anyway, it plans the route and suggests the charging stops. And I'll show you that on the next slide. So then you take off driving two and a half, three hours, you're 150, 200 miles down the road, and you stop at a supercharger, you plug it in, and you take a rest stop. And after three hours, I need a bathroom coffee break. Uh, so I do both of those. And the car has enough charge to continue after about 15 to 20 minutes, often before I finish my coffee. So then at lunchtime, 
take another break, another two or three hours down the road, you stop at a supercharge, you plug it in, you go to lunch. And the car is always charged before lunch is over. It takes 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, this is not a fast food place. You know, if you want to just absolutely minimize your travel time uh, in an ice car and grab a you know, McDonald's uh, hamburger and eat it in your car while you're driving, you're welcome to do that. But I've discovered that this is a much, much more relaxing way to take a long trip. And you don't really lose any time if you're gonna eat in a sit down restaurant. Uh, even if it's a you know pretty fast restaurant. So mid afternoon, you repeat the morning, you stop for another 15, 20 minutes. And then at the end of the day, after a five, 600 mile trip, you stop at a hotel with a destination char charger, you plug it in for an overnight charge. So you restart the next day with your 90% charge and then you cycle through the same thing the next day. So what's that really look like? So I just went out in my car, I think it was in November. My car was only about 50% charged. So there's one extra stop here on the day because of that. Um, but I said, uh, you know, uh, navigate to uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. So it laid out the route, you can see it here. Um, and it, it shows all, shows all of the, uh, recharging points. And I looked at this and, uh, I, I actually did this trip in, uh, June of last year. And this particular supercharger wasn't, didn't even exist in June. So I discovered by doing this little thing so I could show it to you. Uh, I discovered a new supercharger. This supercharger is right next to the interstate I'm on. Whereas the supercharger I used to have to stop at in, uh, in St. Louis was about, you know, 10 minutes off the interstate. It was at a big shopping center. Okay, let's talk about CO2 emissions. Lots of, uh, lots of invalid information on the internet about this. So we're first going to look at a 2015 map of the equivalent lifetime CO2 emissions of EVs and in, in, in the equivalent miles per gallon. So this was created by the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists. And uh, so they did a full analysis of, you know, the costs of transporting oil and refining it and burning it in your car and the same thing for uh, electricity generation for your car and building your car. And this is what it looked like in 2015. So all of the stuff in blue, uh, you're better than nearly any ice card car. Maybe the best mileage uh, Prius uh, might be able to equal it, but mostly not. And only in the central part of the country do you get down to 35 miles per gallon, which is above the average mileage of cars in the U.S. It's about 30 miles per gallon. So you're still beating the average car in the U.S. Uh, in all of all the places. But that's not the real story. The real story is this is changing fast. Here's the 2020 map. Notice it's almost all blue. Even Kansas. Uh, went from 35 miles per gallon to 57 miles per gallon. And that's because there are now huge wind farms in Kansas. So a lot, lot larger percent of their electricity is generated from wind and solar. And they shut down coal power plants uh, as they did this. So the only two spots really that are a problem are Southern Illinois and uh, Eastern Missouri caused by coal plants in Southern Illinois, because there's a lot of coal in Southern Illinois. So they built coal plants really later than they should have been building coal plants, but they did. And then there's another little piece up here. So why is this? Well, it's because the grid itself has become cleaner and there's more efficient EVs. If you know here, this says that the average US EV is 88 miles per gallon equivalent. And back in 2015, the average EV 
sales weighted was 68 miles per gallon. So the EVs are getting more efficient. The grid is getting more efficient and those combine to make a huge difference. So if you look at the graph of what's going on here, the top curve is the coal generated electricity in the United States. And notice it peaked in, in like 2008, probably just before the uh, uh, collapse of the market. But since then it has dropped off on like almost a cliff. And why is that? It's because coal plants were being converted to natural gas plants because it was cheaper, not because they've been incentivized to do that, uh, because it's cheaper. And meanwhile, the uh, renewables have increased because of uh, solar and uh, wind farms. And so now nuclear, solar and wind, or nuclear renewables and coal are all about the same. By the way, you might say, well, how is it good that you replace the coal plants with natural gas plants? They're both fossil fuels that you have to burn. Well, it turns out natural gas burns way cleaner than coal and it produces half the CO2 for the equivalent amount of electricity. So every increase in natural gas here is a factor of two improvement in the CO2 produced relative to coal plants. If you look at this worldwide, uh, and this was uh, done by the International Council on Clean Transportation using real life data for 2021 cars. So they looked in Europe at the uh, real data for cars on the road, what was their mileage, so forth, of both EVs and uh, EVs on the road and, uh, and ICE cars on the road. And they show that in 2021, Here's the CO2 produced over the lifetime of a uh, battery electric vehicle per kilometer. And here's for the ICE car. So it's about three to one. In the United States, it's like two and a half to one. Uh, so, and it's improving all the time. They, they have a projection for 2030, which is, you know, everybody is up at the two to three to one. Here's China. Of course, they have a lot of coal plants now, so uh, there's not nearly as big a difference. And here's India, which is most almost all coal. And uh, you can see that EVs still win, but not by a huge margin. Okay. Also, people talk about all the expensive metals in EVs and how uh, they're not uh, sustainably mined and so forth. But they don't mention that a typical ice car has lots of expensive metals in it too. In fact, they have one that costs $370 per gram. And uh, that's, that's used in a catalytic converter. Uh, also uh, palladium and uh, platinum are used in catalytic converters. And of course, lead uh, in the battery. And so it's about $1,400 of uh, metals in in an ICE car. And by the way, the, the reason that catalytic converters are now being stolen, actually cut out from under cars when they're in parking lots, is because they can sell the uh, catalytic converter for the recycled metals. Uh, for EVs, lithium is the, is the big quantity item. Uh, but not the most expensive. Cobalt is the most expensive. Manganese, copper, and nickel. And so there's about $3,000 worth of these expensive metals. But what's happening? Cobalt is very costly. You know, it's the biggest cost item. So it's being reduced or eliminated in the newer batteries being produced. Nickel can be replaced by iron. Iron is very cheap uh, relative to nickel. Uh, and you get improved longevity because an iron-based battery can be uh, fully charged and, and discharged 
uh, probably three times the number of times that a nickel-based battery can uh, can be charged, recharged. So it's a kind of a win-win. So I think we've hopefully dispelled some of the myths. The reason there's so many myths is because there's lots of people in the world that do not like the transition to EVs because it jeopardizes their job. job. And, you know, I don't really blame them, but you have to look at who published this article and why they published the article. Because most of the articles on the internet, uh, A, are using Tesla as clickbait. They're using negative information as clickbait. And they're trying to reduce the price of Tesla stock because there's a lot of people that have shorted the uh, Tesla stock over time. So even mainstream and analysts don't understand what's going on. We'll talk more about it that in the next talk. Anyway, so EVs are less green than, green than ICE cars. That's not true. Even including manufacturing and recycling at the end, it's just not true, not even close. We're talking already an order of magnitude of two to three times better for EVs. EV charging takes hours. Well, that's kind of true, but you don't really care if you're sleeping. EVs don't work in the cold. It is absolutely the best car ever in the cold. Let me tell you a story. So there's this guy who lives in Denmark. He owns a, a Model 3 Tesla like I do. He, this week, is on a 3,000-mile trip from Denmark to the northernmost point in Norway. It's 100 miles north of the Arctic Circle. So that last 100 miles is in the dark. He's not going to stop at hotels because he's going to sleep in his car. So it turns out if you put down the back seats in a Model 3, I'm six foot three, I can lay full out in the back of the car. You lay down a, you know, a mat, you can easily sleep in the back of the car. The car has a thing called camp mode, where you tell it what temperature you want it to maintain during the night, and it will keep you comfortably at that temperature. You know, a thin sleeping bag, you can put it down at 50, and not even use much electricity for the night. Absolutely the best. And as I already pointed out, Norway has the highest penetration of EVs. Well, you, you don't get to that high penetration if the cars don't work in the cold. So that is just absolutely not true. Fires. Of course, you know, if you follow news, you know about every Tesla fire that has ever occurred. So it looks like, oh, my God, these things are burning up all the time. Well, it turns out most of the fires didn't even start from the car. They started because the house caught on fire and then it caught the Tesla on fire. There's a few fires that are caused by Tesla's crashing. Um, uh, but again, not many. So there's two, 200,000 ICE cars that caught fire in 2018. They killed 560 people. Not a single Tesla fire has killed anyone. So. Tesla has 10 times fewer fires per billion miles driven than do ICE cars. Now, I will say that the Chevy Bolt EV does have more fires than ICE cars, but it has a recall to replace all the batteries in the Chevrolet Bolt. The bad news for Chevrolet is that means they can't produce any EVs. So in the whole quarter, fourth quarter of 2021, they sold 26 or made 26 EVs because their entire battery supply is going to fix this problem. EVs are expensive, but not over five years for comparable cars. So yes, they're kind of at the high end right now, but they're coming down. And in a few more years, there'll be a $25,000 electric vehicle that's pretty high quality. EV batteries need to replace them at great expense. Well, so that does happen. Uh, the warranty is pretty good, though. You know, it's eight years uh, or um, 
what is it? I think uh, 120,000 miles or something like that is uh, is a warranty. So more than longer than most people drive their cars. Um, they there are cars that have gone 400,000 miles without a battery replacement. Many, many cars. So it's it's not really a big issue. I mean, 400,000 miles, uh, you're going to replace, you know, transmissions and all kinds of things on a regular car. So it's it's not it's not a big difference. Batteries will be a hazardous waste problem. Well, no, they won't be. As I mentioned, catalytic converters are almost all recycled now because it's valuable. Well, batteries are the same way. The lithium alone in the batteries make it worth recycling. If you just took out the lithium from batteries, uh, it would be cheaper than buying new lithium that's been mined. So all batteries from electric cars will be recycled. In fact, all battery plants uh, that are being planned have a recycling center in them. Definitely true for um, uh, Tesla battery factories. In fact, uh, J.B. Straubel was one of the you know early guys uh, with Tesla that brought uh, knowledge of, of how to build batteries so that they don't catch on fire and so forth. Uh, he actually left Tesla and started a battery recycling business. So it's profitable. We don't have enough minerals. Another myth. So kind of like, uh, you know, since the 1970s, they were worried about running out of oil and we never ran out of oil. Same thing is true here. There's enough lithium in one mine in Nevada to convert the entire U.S. fleet of cars and trucks to EVs. It is not a problem. And by the way, once you've done that, now you only have to use recycled lithium. Some battery designs eliminate cobalt. Mentioned was a rare element and nickel is being replaced by iron, as I mentioned. So it's not a problem. So we're about done here. I want to include some useful links. Uh, there's, so uh, it's Tesla superchargers. You can find a, a map of all of them there. Electrifier uh, America, you can locate their chargers. PlugShare is actually the best site. It includes all chargers from all companies. It requires registration, but it's free. And it's worth it because you can precisely say what you're looking for and it'll light up your map with only those things. So it's the, the one to use. They have an app for your uh, phone uh, and it well, works the same way. So ChargePoint and EVGo, two charge, uh, recharge com companies, um, they require registration also. So CO2 info, info uh, some of the stuff I showed, uh, the 2020 Tesla Impact Report, they put one of these out every year. They measure every use of resource in a Tesla plant, manufacturing their cars. Electricity usage, the water usage, the waste, everything. So they put an impact report together. It's just interesting reading. Uh, so uh, a Tesla auto manufacturing plant, especially the one in Shanghai, which is built new from scratch, uh, just blows away any other car maker in terms of use of resources. This, um, you know, I mentioned that I use voice, voice commands. You don't always have to use the uh, display on my car. A list of voice commands is at that location. So you can open the glove box, you can turn the heater up, you can, you can adjust things, you know, all kinds of things by voice. So you don't really have to use the uh, computer interface. So last slide. So my advice, is do not buy a new car without at least taking test drives of equivalent available EVs. And now there's quite a few available. I'll talk about that in our talk on, on Thursday. Be aware that an EV will take some retraining. You know, I mentioned one pedal driving. Uh, you know, using a screen to control a car is different than using a bunch of buttons. But it turns out, since all of you are computer literate, uh, you will not have a, a big problem changing over. Uh, 
it's best if you can charge at home. If you don't live in a place where you can charge at your residence, some of the big advantages of EV go away. Uh, it's still possible though, because you can charge at restaurants and you can charge at shopping centers, uh, or you can go to a su supercharger or you know a fast charging station, uh, but it just won't be as convenient. And finally, uh, there's a link here that will, if you end up buying a Tesla, if you use this link, it'll give you a thousand free supercharging miles for both you and me. Uh, so it's a win-win-win. Tesla wins because they get another sale. Uh, I win because I get a thousand free miles. You win because you get a thousand free miles. So when I came back from Arizona uh, in 2020, uh, you know, a friend of mine's son bought a Tesla using my uh, link. And so I got almost home to the last recharging stop before I had to pay. Okay. You know, I, I, th I think I've turned into an evangelist and, and it's because I really want to spread the joy. I've never used the word joy before in terms of driving a car. I use a car for transportation, right? And I just get in and I drive. But it's actually a joy to have and drive this car compared to a nice car. So it, it just makes you into uh, an evangelist. Okay. So uh, uh, then on Thursday, we'll do some fun stuff and look at the cars that are available and pictures of them and so forth. So, uh, you know, it'll be, a, you know, a little more photogenic. And uh, so uh, hopefully you'll like it. <laughs>